Uh, my name is Maya Santa Maria. I work in the Department of Finance. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm not a PhD economist or anything like that, so I apologize for that. Um, but I do have over 20 year, 22 years, actually, of experience in finance, in banking and insurance. So I've learned things on the dark side. And uh, I joined the Department of Finance about two years ago. And in the Department of Finance, I lead the uh, working group on cryptocurrencies and blockchain. So um, I'm going to introduce the panelists now, if that's okay. Please, uh, Alexis, come on board. And uh, Hans York, would you like to come join us? <laughs> Max. And uh, Giacomo, I think you may have um, seen his presentation this morning. Okay, so Giacomo actually was uh, presenting this morning, so um, I think you hopefully will have seen his presentation. I won't say anything else. Uh, Max is CEO of um, Hoddle. Hoddle, do I pronounce it right? Okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, Hans Jorg is the uh, chief head of invest capital global markets capital and research. So and long, it's global invest. It's a bit long, sorry for this. <laughs> but it's the it's the uh, it's the inside I piece I actually really like very much. And um, Alexis, you are chairman and CEO of Financial.com. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a <coughs> Munich-based uh, financial information company. And yeah, basically, I'm, I'm representing the old uh, I'm a fintech since uh, 1999, but I'm representing the old economy, so I got my tie on. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, Okay, yeah, actually, I mean, between all of us, have a lot of many years in uh, financial services. I think you both, uh, um, Hans-Jörg and Alexis, you've been in financial services for over 20 years. Um, Mark, I think you were in private, um, private banking and wealth for over 10 years as well? Uh, yes, I was a private banker and asset management, wealth management for 10 Ooh. years prior to joining to crypto. So I know both worlds pretty well. Well, I had a bank account once. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see, <laughs> so we do strive for a variety of experience to make the panel discussion interesting. So there you go. Um, let's let's pick action on on that topic because um, on my experience from financial services, when we talk about uh, cryptocurrency, and I try to speak about it or at least present it to um, policy makers and regulators, I find a little bit like morpheus in the metrics. Yeah, when you you feel like you're actually giving people either a red pill or a blue pill, you know which one is it going to be? Um, Mostly it's because it feels like people either love cryptocurrency and Bitcoin or they seem to fear it and hate it. And I think maybe the realities might be somewhere in between. Um, and certainly that's something I'd like to explore more in the panel discussion today. Okay? Um, who would like to go first? Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I'd love to because I feel I'm the advocate of the early of today. Mm -hmm. And I simply want to change your perspective on Bitcoin a bit. Um, so if I may, I'd like to draw your attention on, your attention on this uh, slide. And this slide is, so to say, is a history of panics, maniacs, and crashes at financial markets throughout the history of financial markets as such. And when you take the different lines plotted here, uh, and what you might see is a so-called day zero. That was for any asset class being uh, on that chart here. Uh, day zero was the highest price of that asset class. And then it was plotted back uh, five years into its own history. Uh, and uh, the line then corresponds uh, the years after, uh, since nowadays or the next five years after the highest price. And guess which, one, which line reflects Bitcoin? the blue one. And knowing that uh, the left-hand side is in logarithmic terms, uh, you, would, you would say that in comparison with all the other bubbles we had throughout the history of financial markets, the Bitcoin, let me call it like this bubble we saw in, the, in December 2017, was by far the largest bubble, at least when it comes to the price uh, increases we saw, we, had, we, we saw the years before. Well, a picture from time to time might tell you less 
than a thousand words because uh, it's uh, just a picture uh, talking about or reflecting bubble history such as the tulip mania and others. And the fact point is, is it really a bubble we are talking about or isn't it? When you take the Kindleberger criteria, I come to the conclusion clearly we are in the middle of a bubble uh, when it comes to Bitcoin. All the criteria uh, as uh, being named or hammered home by Kindleberger, he was an historian in economics, uh, in my view fulfilled. There is a fantasy of a new technology, there is much circulation, there is much liquidity flowing around searching for yield, there is a fantasy of a new technology, as I just said, new financial vehicles, be it the CBOE futures, be it uh, mm -hmm. mutual fund investment vehicles of nowadays, and so on and so forth. So to make a long story short, I, I would say sure. clearly Bitcoin primarily is a phenomenon of a bubble, and uh, we are in it. It might just be a, a second part of uh, what we are just seeing. Uh, and I even doubt that it's an asset class. This morning we talked about Bitcoin being an asset class. Me as, an, as an investor, I would say an investment professional, I would say, no, it's clearly not an asset class. Why should it be? A market cap is too low for being an, a nameable asset class. 150, uh, what was it, billions of US dollars. That's nothing in comparison with equity markets or any other kind of financial market. It has and has not any intrinsic value. You might say, okay. well, it's just like gold. Yes, Bitcoin is just like gold in that sense. But gold for me is not an asset class, it's a religion. Uh, okay, Hans well. Jörg, sorry. Uh, therefore, um, just, sorry, uh, Hans Jörg, can I stop you there? Because um, I, I do appreciate your, your comments, I think they're valid. And um, I'm sure the uh, G20 ministers meeting in Fukuoka next week would love to have you there. Um, but uh, <laughs> we do have uh, uh, three other panelists. Um, and to that point, actually, I mean, you're obviously quite feeling quite strong about it not being a, an asset of sorts. But maybe it's because you're looking at it for something new from a, an old traditional lens. So... Um, what do you think, Alexis? Well, um, it's really hard for me to add uh, something more. I, I pretty much agree with, with the previous uh, um, presenter. But um, yeah, actually, um, Bitcoin is, is kind of a narrative. And if it would deliver what it's uh, uh, talking about, if it would become a money, then it would be a deflationary asset. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And as uh, deflation. Disinflationary, okay, I'm sorry. But uh, as, as mentioned the earlier question. today, mm -hmm. this would be this will cause huge problems because, yeah. I mean, um, we, we have experienced the Great Depression, uh, um, we have seen World War II, so deflation is not an option. So I think uh, what, what people always uh, see as the most, or the positive aspect being the uh, cap by 21 million, I, I personally see it as the, the biggest problem of the Bitcoin. Okay. Um. I'll go directly to you, Mark. Would you like to, to Max? Okay, that'd be great. Because yeah. at the end of the day, what we're saying is, we know that Bitcoin was actually created to, to not follow traditional legacy systems. Does it matter? Um, yeah, actually, I, I just wanted to comment on that because mm -hmm. during my banking times, I was handling a lot of papers to my client with uh, different performance assets. And each of these papers contained the words, small words, um, on, on the below that past performance doesn't doesn't guarantee the future performance That's of correct. the asset. <laughs> so I think that um, we're living in a new age, digital age. And That's uh, what I heard in the year 2000 as well. What? That's what I heard in the year 2000 as well. And you don't have internet And anymore. a couple of years ago as well. <laughs> no, but uh, there was Apple on the horizons already. Uh, and there always, there always have been valuation metrics. <laughs> Mine is still working. Uh, but nevertheless, there are still valuation metrics. So start trying to value Bitcoin. Try to make Can it. I finish my Thanks. story? Thanks, yes. Thanks Max. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so I wouldn't value or I wouldn't compare Bitcoin to previous asset classes mm -hmm. because, again, it's decentralized by nature. And to understand the decentralization thing in the simple words, you have thousands of people in the world now at this moment working on the Bitcoin. Nobody out of them are coordinated by any central bank or anything else. Uh, I think that Bitcoin is an asset class. Maybe you can't compare it to the traditional asset classes mm. due to the nature of that and due to the idea behind that. 
but it's also a social economical phenomena for me personally because a part of the having promises tech and all that stuff we also have a very strong community of smart people who are working on that and as i say previously they're doing that in decentralized way yeah away from financial services. So one would potentially say that it's um, a financial services institution will not be happy, obviously, by Bitcoin, because effectively they'll be coming into their own lunch as potential competitors. So it's natural to obviously understand the, your point of view, Alex and Hans Jörg. Can, can but, I just add okay, something? Yeah. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> there, there's a nice book written by two researchers in the US, Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff, it covers um, 800 years of financial crisis, and the title of the book says, this time is different. Yeah? Mm. And um, they ma they're making a joke of it because um, they say, well, the times are different, the, the technology is different, uh, I, I don't know what else is different, but people are always the same. Yeah? So uh, the, 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 the human mindset yeah, uh, is always the same, and people always tell a, a new story why this time is different, and then they learn that everything is, is, is just the same. So this is uh, just a history of 800 years. It was 63 or 60-something 60 financial crisis, so it's, it's always been the same. So it's, if, if someone mentions this time is different, be cautious. Yeah. That, is, that applies to government currencies. But asset prices, we're, we're talking about asset prices. If it's, if it, if, if, yeah, exactly. But, okay, let, let, yeah, they, they're focusing on democracies, and, and, mm -hmm. and a democracy yeah, needs inflation. Why? Because politicians pay more than they can afford, so they issue debt, yeah, to, and, and they say the future taxpayer will repay, but there's no future taxpayer. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, but you, you need it. You need it. You need it. So uh, otherwise, a democracy wouldn't work. Yeah? So this, this, I think yeah, there's no inflation. <laughs> So, so this is what we've learned uh, from 800 years is that a democracy needs inflation. Yeah, it will always end up in inflation. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is a good business model. Riches is the best business model. Yeah, you promise a better life after death. Yeah, you can uh, get money up front. No one reclaims. Yeah, if this doesn't happen, but that's there's, there's no regulation. Yeah, but <laughs> so, that's how we, that's how money was invented. Yeah, so, so, actually so, so religion yeah. is religion definitely is the best business model for essence. Yes. And Bitcoin is kind of a religion. Well, let's put it this way. That's we can say that's how money. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, me. Let, let me. Let well, we're not going to get personal, please. And we want to end of the day in a good, good note. Uh, Jack, what would you think about all this? So I agree with most that have been said. I mean, uh, Bitcoin uh, is uh, a bubble in a way. Uh, for well, so, uh, rhetorically, we could say that Bitcoin is not the bubble; is it's the pin. That's the typical rhetorical answer, mm -hmm. which means that uh, it's a bubble that basically is going to grow and never really burst if the alternative bubble of uh, the you know the government uh, central yeah. planning of money is going mm -hmm. to burst. It's a decorrelated bubble. It's an anti-correlated bubble. If uh, the bet on central planning of money is going to succeed, Bitcoin is not going to succeed. But since uh, I agree with the, the second sentence that uh, every time somebody says that this time is different, uh, that there is a red flag, and uh, central planning always failed in the past, and mm -hmm. this time is probably not different. Okay. So Bitcoin is a, is a pin that will burst the bubble. But uh, it's also true what uh, Dan said uh, also this morning and yesterday. Bitcoin actually is moving like a bubble. Bitcoin yeah. is not really uh, facing the phenomenon of modern monetization in a smooth way is not that everybody is going to agree to smoothly pour resources into Bitcoin. There will be, uh, there will be phases, there will be wave, there will be FOMO, there will be food, there will be uh, basically adjustment of expectation and, and very strong correction. We are, we are seeing that all the time. Bitcoin actually is not a bubble. It's a collection of bubbles. The only point is that this bubble always bursts uh, at the higher point than the previous. So it's, uh, it's okay. We, yeah. we are continues to create in bubbles, we are bursting the bubbles and we are going up like this. Eventually, while the market debt grows, the, uh, the volatility level is going down. We are seeing that already. Mm -hmm. But it's a collection of bubbles. Also, the, the other interesting thing is that the traditional bubble, so the stock market bubble created by manipulation of interest rates, yeah. is somehow influencing Bitcoin. I think that it's a safe bet that the manipulation of interest rates creates incentives to overinvest and misinvest. 
and maybe part of that uh, uh, crazy liquidity is also going into Bitcoin or worse into, uh, t technically speaking, shit coins. So, uh, so yeah, Bitcoin is an anti-bubble. Uh, Bitcoin is a collection of several bubbles, uh, and Bitcoin is probably also helped by all the government-driven bubbles. Okay. Um, that's it very much. That was a, um, can can I just differentiate? Okay, I, the bubbles? I, I, I really like blockchain technology, and I think there are many currencies out there that are better than okay. Bitcoin, so don't get me wrong on this. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> it's good that we agree. Okay, maybe I wasn't super clear about that, but... Uh, <laughs> well, I always reach about the asset class thing. Uh, I agree that, the, I mean, as we said this morning, and it was repeated, Bitcoin is still an experiment. For example, the mm -hmm. market cap of Bitcoin is still very low. We cannot call it uh, an asset class in a typical financial yes. sense. That said, the reason I usually talk, I mean, uh, from my experience of having had a bank account, I talk with uh, finance, finance people. And uh, when I talk with them, I call Bitcoin an asset class for this simple reason. It is an asset, for sure, with a very, uh, with a very strong price dynamics, but it's not not clearly part of any other known asset class. And if you try to frame it as another existent asset class, it will show some kind of dynamic that are completely different. For example, decentralization of, uh, of decisions or price dynamics or uh, historical dynamics. Uh, it's also, I mean, it's a religion. Uh, that's true, it is a religion. Uh, it is also a digital gold, it is also a brand, it is also a growing technology. So the reason it's an asset class is not size. Eventually, if it succeeds, we will get there to a relevant size. Right now, the size is very small, but the nature, it cannot be, uh, if, we, if we want to be honest, scientifically speaking, we cannot really fit this into any other specific asset class. But given that, as a characterization, is simply not sufficient to make it investable, I would say. And for me, everything and anything that's not investable is not an asset class, full stop. Okay. And, and you might say gold is some kind of an asset class because there's some more gold outside, uh, out there, than, than bitcoins. Well, yes, fair point. Uh, but even would go further ahead saying an investment class for me is something I can generate some kind of return. And I'm saying I'm talking about intrinsic value of that asset class. So if you have And any not to return in a sense of uh, uh, prices uh, rising and therefore generating a return as such. So if you have one single asset that for a correlation level can lower the general risk of your portfolio, unless it's big enough to be its own asset class, you will not use it to, to mitigate the risk or to better. What, what, what he just said uh, what was quite good. Uh, past performance is no indication for future results. So why should I take past performance or past volatility uh, to make it, uh, to take it as a diversifiable asset class? I simply don't see it as such. You might say, well, there are equities, there are bonds, uh, there are other type of currencies. Uh, that's okay. They have their own track record, but Bitcoin is just out there it's some kind of a token and you might say it's investable yes you may go into it and out of it but given that kind of volatility we have seen throughout the last couple of years uh, knowing uh, that the price increases outnumber all other kinds of bubbles we've had for me, it's just something for those who love it, who believe in it. Uh, and I come back to what you just mentioned. This time it's different. Yes, it's a fantastic book and everyone should read it. And this time it's really different and these are the most expensive words of the history of uh, financial uh, history. This time it's different. So whenever you hear it, better, you'd better stay away from that kind of asset. Not asset class, but vehicle. Nice. And it comes, oh, so, okay, please. <laughs> So I think there's something extremely misleading about the chart that you place, which is that it goes back only five years from the top of the bubble. Now, if mm -hmm. you put up the five years before that, all of the bubbles that you put would not show up in the graph. They would all be stuck next to the x-axis. Mm -hmm. Even on a logarithmic graph, Bitcoin rises so much that all the other bubbles are insignificant. And I think this is where you need to start revisiting your priors and revisiting your assumptions, because the amount of appreciation that Bitcoin has achieved in 10 years is about 80 million percent. So even if it loses 99% of its value, it still outperformed everything else in human history over the last 10 years. So there's something there that's different. Even if it loses all that value, there's still value that has been created, more than 150 billion in 10 years. It's a great story. It's a great story. 
No, that's not a great story. You need to ask yourself why and find another explanation other than just dismissing it. And the explanation is... Oh, yeah, so Okay, next time I take 10 years, it makes it even worse. No, 10 years is that's, or 20 years, when, whenever it started. I, I don't worry about this. No, uh, but the thing is, is a plot, I, is a, what I plotted here is a comparison where it's not only Talib mania and other kind of narrative, that's a good word for Talib mania probably, uh, but all the other kind of uh, equity class, uh, of, of asset classes you, you've had and you're still having, such as US stocks, German stocks, and, and any others, and Japanese ones. Uh, and having that, this, they reflect economic power, nothing else. And Bitcoin reflects a religion. There is a difference here, and therefore I'm making this point. No, religion and, is the and notion that we have papers from the government with God on them. That's a okay. Oh, come, come, come on, come on. We need... We need, we need <laughs> We, 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 need, we need to discuss fiat money. To, to make that point clear, what I like most about Bitcoin uh, is the fact that I'm a Hayekian like probably many of you here in the audience. So I'm, I'm as an economist, I'm, a de I'm an adherent or a disciple, you might even say, of uh, Friedrich von Hayek. And he made a very valid point, but he did not talk about uh, Bitcoin. He, he talked about uh, the denationalization of money. And uh, I even doubt that Bitcoin is a currency and therefore it's not money. So what would it take for you to revise that idea? So 10 years from now, Bitcoin is 10 times where it is today, so $80,000 per coin. So we've had 20 years of growth in Bitcoin and 20, 200 million percent. Would you still think that it is a collapse? Because the key thing that you need to confront is that every one of these is a bubble, as Giacomo was saying. And yet, after each bubble, we end up above the previous high. So next time what I bring with me is a better chart, even or I, I don't have it with me, but it's even more enlightening probably. You take that chart with a Bitcoin price and what you then take next is a, is a yield, not the yield curve, but the 10 years yield uh, of sovereign bonds, be it US or Europe, or even more so with the lending rate of central banks. Uh, and the lending rate of central banks do reflect a very simple story. We have been in a negative yield environment for more than 10 years in major Major, part, major parts of the world. And interesting to see that just before uh, the central banks, US central bank changed gear in the year 2017, uh, the bubble collapsed, and now, given the fact that the ECB and the, central, uh, the Federal Reserve once again changed gear backwards, so injecting even more so liquidity, right. I, I, oh, sorry. Uh, it I'll just restarted again. Let's so just try to answer sorry, the Hunter, question. Like, so at which answer answer point that. do we re re uh, basically revise our position? So I would say, for example, that uh, if uh, in a time horizon of uh, 30 years, uh, uh, that's maybe too much, but let, let's be bold. I say that if it's uh, in, in five years, for example, a good per percentage of uh, asset allocation in, uh, in political sensitive uh, areas or b b international bla black and gray markets do not use Bitcoin, I will start to seriously reconsider the effectiveness of the, of the project, of the experiment, which, because it is an experiment. At which point do you see Bitcoin growing without collapsing, uh, except with some volatility, and you accept that this time is really different? Is there a threshold where you revise it, your position? Um, need to think about it very carefully, but given the fact that just a few of millions of people are using it, obviously, and given the fact that if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, one third or even more of bitcoins are being mined in China, uh, knowing uh, that uh, it takes just a majority of 50 plus percent to change the rules. It doesn't. Oh, that's okay. A, that, that's a misconception. Okay. okay. Uh, you need actually every. Then, then, because that needs to be from the table. Obviously, it's, it needs to be not uh, being manipulative or manipulated. If that uh, was that's, the that's case, Bitcoin thing. would be very. It, risky needs, it needs to be m more widely spread, and that's simply not the case. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't forget that we have one, uh, one more than one thousand other cryptocurrencies. How about these currencies? So, do we know when whether they use. will survive? That's what you are saying. Others are telling me uh, they are in use. So. So even thinking about building uh, mutual funds on cryptocurrencies to uh, have a diversification effect. Yeah, but this conference is called value on Bitcoin, not the value on other shit coins, you know. The non-value of Bitcoin. I, I would change my mind uh, if it becomes a legal tender, obviously.
Oh, so independently of price dynamics, it's not a, bu a, a bubble if it's legal tender. So, so in Japan, it's a legal tender, and now we can start changing the minds. Because since 2017, Bitcoin is a legal tender in Japan, and Japan, as far as I understand, in top three economies in the I, world. I would, I would it's, sorry, it's actually not... Sorry, sorry. It's not Let's legal. Get back I just want to qualify this. It's I'm actually not legal tender, but it's actually accepted as a means yes, of payment, which is slightly different. Okay. If, if, if um, my understanding of a legal tender is that there's a monetary policy behind it, yeah? yeah. Oh, so that's... Oh, not, oh that's yeah, not I, the I, case. I, I, you, you. <laughs> that really suits yeah. it. That's maybe why it's different this yeah. time, you know. There's no monetary policy. Yeah, and this is the reason why I'm skeptical. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's not a bubble if there is a, a political decision for the supply. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think you, you can argue about monetary sure. policy. You can love or hate central banks. I don't, this is an emotional question. You can hate them. Yeah? But I think it's indisputable that a variable uh, amount of goods needs a flexible monetary supply. So a fixed money supply with a, very, uh, with a growing amount of goods, is, it doesn't work. So you can hate or love central banks, I don't care, but I think uh, you need to have a flexible monetary supply. How does the Bitcoin economy grow to $150 billion from zero over 10 years with a fixed money supply? Great story. Thank you. Great story. Oh, great just great experiment. community, 20 million Bitcoiners, I don't know. Well, how, what number of people would you take to admit this is more than a story? If a billion people are no, using I, it? I, I mean, if it's, if it's a legal tenor, if it's... If it's, if it's, if it's <laughs> well, if the government goes out of business and the government currencies go out of business, but Bitcoin is still there, will you revise then? It's not legal tender. Not, not the chart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's a cons internally consistent definition. Oh. Yeah. That's a fair point. I know it's not very popular here. <laughs> Sorry. It's only going to get less popular. <laughs> And it's a very interesting point because I'm still actually with my accounting financial services hat on. I'm still struggling to uh, struggling to understand how, if it's not any type of asset and it's some kind of bubble, it's not okay to kind of invest in it, but it's totally okay to invest in the derivatives that invest in the asset. I'm like, how do you actually marry the two of them up? So, it's uh, an interesting uh, theory, all right? Um, listen, this is very interesting. We have ten minutes to go before beers, and uh, Satoshi Nakamoto has just sent in a, a question on Slido. That's okay. Uh, so we're going to raise that one. So it's a question for Hans York Naumer. Um, if Bitcoin is simply religion, is Satoshi God? What do you think? Uh, let, let me think about no? it. Probably more kind <laughs> of a devil, uh, I would say, because those who call themselves God are usually more kind of a diabolic uh, type of person. I wouldn't say it's Satoshi, is it? Uh, of course, don't get me wrong, but the question is such as rubbish. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's get a bit more serious. Um, Bitcoin markets are liquid and prone to heavy manipulation. Does it need the traditional system to root out the bad actors? I go first if you want. My opinion is no. The 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 kind the side effect of regulation is always to make it easy uh, to manipulate everything for the friends of the regulator and to create a barrier to competition in order to evolve toward a more the transparent and uh, and self-regulated system. So right now uh, this is not denying that the Bitcoin market, especially the exchange-based market, is super manipulated right now. It's mm. very very low liquidity, very low debt. Uh, exchanges can see they stop loss and, and go down and take them and um, most exchanges, not the not custodian. Not the hot hot. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, because it's, there, there are some difference in uh, custodianship strategies and stuff. There are some exchanges which are doing a better job. But the point is, uh, the point is this. Uh, I, I have been born in Italy and there is a bank there, a very ancient bank. It's called Monte dei Paschi di Siena. Yep. Uh, it failed uh, probably 50 times and, uh, test, and yep. government bail out people and regulate and so moral hazard grows and it fails again and again. Mm. Then uh, I had some like three bitcoins on empty gox. Uh, no government bailed me out because of, for my three bitcoins and I'm super happy because that created the opposite of moral hazard. That created a, a period in which people started to think about exchange security. So mm -hmm. when you don't regulate and when you don't bail out, when you don't manipulate, when you, uh, when you let people learn from their mistake and suffer from their mistake, you have a pr an imperfect process of learning. While when you try to step in and to, uh, and to central plan 
scan uh, things uh, violating the normal feedback loops, then you're just creating, maybe the system is perfect at the beginning, but then it degenerates at the end. So regulators are always increasing moral hazard. They are never solving everything. Even if in the short run they are going to, uh, to stop some scam, they will produce bigger scam in the end. <laughs> well, let's, I think that's I, I think we'll just set there, Giacomo. It goes really well with the discussions we had earlier on today as well about how Bitcoin is a social contract, part of an experiment. So when you're actually putting all that together, you can understand why maybe it's not a normal asset, certainly from the view that we're looking from a traditional finance perspective, um, particularly because it actually looks at reinventing Remanaging, actually allowing people to have control in their finances. We talked about uh, the, the, a market for private money. That's new. You know what we're saying here is maybe we shouldn't be looking at something new with the lenses of of an old of an old world. Um, should we move on to a question from the audience? Because you seem to have woken up, and I really like that. What is intrinsic value? <laughs> intrinsic value. Come on, you should know this, aren't you? Don't you? <laughs> intrinsic value simply is you take, uh, let's say, a share an equity part of an enterprise of a corporation, and you ask yourself what's, what are the returns to be expected in terms of earnings for the next couple of years. And what you are going to generate is earnings, and you get date dividends, and then you can uh, give it a price. That's explained for equities. We could go ahead uh, and explain mm -hmm. it for real, esta real estate, whatever you have in mind. So it's not a problem. The systematic as such is quite simple. But it's nothing such uh, with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what is tell me what is the intrinsic value? Is anyone here being able to say what the intrinsic value of a Bitcoin is? Please tell me. What? Zero. Zero. Oh. Zero. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ciro. Well, no, I, I will disagree about that. So, uh, first that of all, I think <laughs> <laughs> a better distinction, I think, will be between exchange, expected exchange value and consumption, direct consumption value. So, this is a very clear distinction. But even if you do that kind of, so if you have a piece of bread, you can sell it, but you can also eat it, while usually a, 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 a good form of money has very low consumption value, is mostly a, a, a store of value and a medium of exchange. So, you want to exchange that. Bitcoin, in this regard, is is different. For example, there is a uh, there is a Selgin, George Selgin saying that this is the first time that there is a, a synthetic commodity. So this is a good argument. Uh, mm -hmm. All the commodities we used as, as money in the history started as something used for something else, for example, uh, decorative purposes or collectibles, and then they evolved to be used as money. Bitcoin in this sense has the presumption to be designed directly in order to assume uh, the function of money. So in this sense, it is a more bold uh, it, is a, it is a bet which is more ambitious. But uh, a, a one Bitcoin has the same kind of consumption value of any kind of scarce collectible. Imagine that you have an autograph uh, by a, a basketball player or you have like the T-shirt the of, uh, of uh, Mick Jagger uh, with some sweat. So what is the consumption value of that? I mean, m many, modern, many pieces of modern art, you can say there is a consumption artistic value now. I mean, they are horrible. But there is the only value is that you have that and nobody else does. So there is a, the, the, the fact that sometimes we say that price value arises from scarcity and, and demand, but the truth is that scarcity itself in some condition uh, in the dynamic of, uh, of uh, collectibles can be itself a, a direct consumption, even if you don't plan to exchange your, uh, your autograph of a famous person with somebody, the fact that it is scarce that uh, you have it and other people don't is itself a consumption value. Indeed, there is an hypothesis that is uh, um, even commodity money didn't, it didn't really evolve from uh, consumption goods, but it did evolve from collectibles. So people were showing off shells because these shells were rare. They, can, they could have it and other people couldn't. And then they understood that they can also store shells and exchange shells, and it evolves with uh, Mises regression theory. Uh, bit, but I accept the fact that Bitcoin is different because Bitcoin was designed to become money, while no previous... Uh, kind of money except for fiat shitcoin had the same kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, of origin. But to just explain, there's nothing else in public economics. Thank you for this, because modern arts is just the same as Bitcoin when it comes to prices and liquidity. 
you're trusting Searching the market. You're trusting the generic market aggregates. You're trusting. Uh, ex you're expecting some kind of behavior from the market, and you know the market behavior uh, cannot be mm -hmm. changed by single-endedly by any single entity. And so you expect uh, typical social long-term dynamic Lindy effect, uh, network effects. You expect uh, you trust something. It's not true that Bitcoin is trustless. You trust math, and you trust uh, typical economic uh, economic laws. Sorry, please go ahead. Uh, for me personally, gold is not a religion, not at all a religion. Uh, and my question is, why do central banks uh, buy gold and why does a mini breed? Buy gold as a substitute. Ask, ask someone agree. I can't tell for them. We have we have better, better asset classes to invest, but we are in competitors, so to say. Uh, why do they invest? It's a matter of culture. It's a matter that others believe in. And uh, Dr. Wallet just put it quite nicely. We are in a talking for the Federal Reserve that the Fed is able to create its own currency. That we should uh, do the same, having the ECB. Uh, and therefore, your point is a very valid point. But does gold make any kind of sense? No, it doesn't. We are simply believing in it, like we are believing in that the prices of modern arts might uh, skyrocket even further like, or something, whatever. Uh, like we're believing that fiat money is actually somehow powered by central banks. You know? I don't believe in fiat money at all. I'm just using it to transfer things perhaps to store value to a certain extent. I'd, I'd rather store value with real assets. That's what we are going to have outside in forms of drinks, but that's what you might also have in forms of equities or something. Uh, I'd never believe in anything. Let me make that oh, point so when, it, when it comes to financial markets. We should start from markets. that. Okay. But, I, I agree. Uh, but <laughs> thing is, when it has an intrinsic value, that helps a lot to anchor it and to anchor its value. So US dollar taken as such is just a matter of transfer of transfer value for it. Uh, excuse me, maybe to add a discussion from an IT perspective. You know, I, I believe that the real value of the Bitcoin system lies in the network. Mm -hmm. It's the most powerful compute and storage network which is out there. And we have seen through the presentation the factor of security and immutable data. And this is where the value grows. And as more people trust and the belief comes in, this will generate the value. <coughs> this is unmatched. I mean, you cannot deny it. Yeah, yeah, and I would see intrinsic value as well. I mean, this uh, Bitcoin has become the base currency for all the other cryptos. Exactly. So this, this may yes. be. Bitcoin ecosystem, right? Where you have a base layer. But this is only a few fractions. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I also believe to add, it's not a Bitcoin only ecosystem because you have great use cases out there. I mean, take Ripple, we have people talk about it. Cross border consequences. It is a Bitcoin conference. Sorry. Let me just finish my statement. The next phase of the Bitcoin will be decentralized. So it's smart contract systems, decentralized apps all those things. So there will be prominent use cases where Bitcoin lies the foundation of trust for us to connect to that. We could work one point to the other. So, I so I'm switching to your side of nihilism because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> can, can I add uh, something to the, the gold yeah. question? Um, I just want to quote uh, Warren Buffett, one, one of the best investors of our time. Um, he just wrote in his uh, annual uh, letter... Yeah, no. but a very smart guy. And he said, uh, he's 88 years, yeah? and he said, during his lifetime, the national debt of the US has grown by 400,000%, 400,000% in 88 years. And there have always been people um, fighting monetary policy, uh, buying gold, yeah? and overall, the people who bought gold yeah, had the worst performance over 88 years. So, so. usually uh, uh, entities which are very deep in debt, eventually they fail, but this time it's different, right? I, 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 I would say, <laughs> it, it, it's just, 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 no, 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 no. I, I would say an asset class, an asset class is something, an asset class in my, in my view is, right. an asset pays you a dividend or an interest. Yeah? Okay. So if it's a company, this, uh, 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 the, Mr. From, uh, the, the presenter from the Fed, he said he'd rather buy the S&P. So do I. Yeah. Yeah. I. I would rather buy the S&P yeah, and, and okay. hold it for like decades. Yeah. I think I might stop it here because it is time to go out for a beer. Um, 
I'd like to thank the panelists, but I will like to leave you all with a thought, which I'm going to read out straight out. It's the first sentence from Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. And the sentence says, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. So just consider that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> it was good. It was good, actually. Hmm?